Do you struggle with reading phylogenetic trees? In this video, I'll be breaking down the primary structural components of phylogenetic trees, including the tips, the nodes, the branches, and the root. Let's just hop right into it. A phylogeny is a representation of evolutionary relationships. This phylogeny here shows us the relationships between various primate species. For example, if we zoom into this portion of the phylogeny, we can see that humans, chimpanzees, and bonobos are all connected to one another. To help us understand these connections, let's look at a simplified phylogeny. We'll use this example here. This phylogeny shows the three primary parts of any phylogenetic tree. The tips, the nodes, and the branches. On here, tips are represented by the blue squares. And tips are just the terminal unit of a phylogeny. They can be species, as we are often used to seeing, however they can be any unit of life. If we go back to our example phylogeny, we can see that the tips are corresponding to humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and other primate species. These are units of life, they are species, However, we could also make a phylogeny that shows the larger groupings of mammals, how the primates are related to the rodents, for example. Or we can even dive down deeper. We could, for example, take humans and create a phylogeny that shows the different populations of humans all over the world, or even down to individual humans. It's totally possible with a phylogeny. Another critical component of phylogenies are the nodes, which are represented here by the red circles. Nodes represent diverging points on the phylogenetic tree of life, and they are used to tell us how organisms are connected to one another. If we go back to our example phylogeny, we see that we have internal nodes here and here. I'll represent them with the red circles just to maintain consistency. These nodes tell us where two groups or two tips have diverged from one another. For example, the chimpanzees and the bonobos diverged from one another at this internal node. Or we could also say, looking at this phylogeny, that humans right here, I'll represent them with a little more of a blue dot, uh, diverged from the group containing chimpanzees and bonobos at this internal node. Essentially, these internal nodes allow us to map the tree of life. Finally, we have branches, which we are going to represent with these green lines. Branches are simply how the internal nodes are connected to one another and to the tips. While all branches connect nodes and tips to one another, the length of the branch is dependent on the phylogeny itself. Some phylogenies have no information contained in the branch lengths. They only tell us how information is connected to one another. These we call a cladogram. This phylogeny here is an example of a cladogram. The lengths of these branches contain absolutely no information. On a time-calibrated phylogeny, such as the one shown here, Branch lengths typically correspond to millions of years of evolutionary history. For example, this branch length of six, which is connecting the humans to the ch group containing chimpanzees and bonobos at this internal node, is representing six million years of evolutionary history. Another way to put this is that humans and chimpanzees diverged from one another six million years ago. Another common phylogeny is genetic distance, where the branch lengths measure some form of evolutionary distance between tips or nodes. For those types of phylogenies, make sure you understand precisely what the number means, as the metrics they use to measure diversity and distance differ considerably between studies. One thing that trips up new students when it comes to branch lengths are these vertical portions of the phylogenetic tree. Just know that these have no length and they are simply there for demonstrative purposes. Uh, it's really just how we visualize phylogenies. For example, if I hop over into the interactive tree of life, which is how I make a lot of my phylogenies, we can change how this looks and change the nodes to just be curved, right? We can remove that vertical line altogether, and these relationships don't change. Uh, here, I'll toggle between them, uh, straight lines, curved lines, no difference in relationships. But we can also change this to a slanted tree, 
uh, which is a more common version of a tree that you'll often see uh, drawn out. Typically with these style of trees, you'll see them uh, drawn in a, this style more where it's straight line and then coming up like this. And if we wanted to remake this phylogeny, we would just put uh, humans here, chimps here, and bonobos here. Uh, but all this to say that the vertical lines mean absolutely nothing on a phylogenetic tree. They're just there for demonstrative purposes so that they're easier to read. Finally, we have the root of the phylogeny. The root is simply the point where all of the tips of the phylogeny come together. It is the most recent common ancestor for all of the descendants. So on this very simplified phylogeny we have here, our root is simply at this internal node here. It is the one that is furthest back in time on the phylogenetic tree of life, and it connects all of the tips to that node. This is what the root is, but we will actually cover this as well as how to find a most recent common ancestor in more depth in an upcoming video, so stay tuned for that. If you want to take your tree reading skills to the next level, my three-part program, Reading Phylogenies, might just be for you. This program covers the core components of phylogenetic trees, phylogenetic groups and what they mean, as well as common misconceptions and misunderstandings when it comes to reading phylogenies. All of my courses contain video lectures, written text, as well as quizzes and mastery checks designed to cement your understanding of the concepts. You can find the link down in the description. Thank you!